Welcome back to Baltimore Backyards. I'm Chris Swain. On this episode, we have a special treat. I got to sit down and talk with Marin Gimple, who is the Associate Director for Foreman's Branch Bird Observatory Center for Environment and Society at Washington College in Chestertown on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. The center just banded 350,000 birds for tracking and scientific purposes. That bird happened to be a tiny golden crowned kinglet, one of my favorites. We're excited to hear about this. I had so many questions, so here's part of our discussion. I work for the Foreman's Branch Bird Observatory, and our main research projects that we do are spring and fall bird banding. And so bird banding, if people haven't heard of it, it's licensed or permitted through the federal governments with training to handle wild birds. Wild birds are protected by various treaties. We catch them in these soft mist nets. They're sort of like a volleyball net, but much finer uh, mesh. You learn to gently untangle them, bring them back to a central location. And banding just means we literally put a metal band around their leg. It has a unique number on it. So anywhere that bird goes again and is found, they know, they, whoever finds it, knows whose it is. It's like getting a social security number um, for a bird. And then we take some measurements and record a little bit of data and send the bird on its way. So most of my work is this fall and spring migration bird banding. And the migration is so important because that's just when there's so many birds moving. It's like rush hour for birds. If you went out today and I opened all my same nets in my same locations, I might only get you know, 30 or 40 birds. And if you open nets in the fall in the exact same place, you could get 300 because fall and spring is like rush hour, like all the birds are on the move. So that's yeah. like the super broad overview. It sounds like there's so many intricacies in that, the complexity of it. Um, the nets that you guys use, are, are they are they baited in or are these fired out of some kind of device how does that work because i imagine that's got to be a you got to be very careful because obviously you're in this to help learn about birds yes. and, and you never yep. want to run so, the risk of hurting them right bird safety is our top priority yeah. it depends what kind of research projects people are doing people that study bigger birds like waterfowl they do use nets that are launched out of a cannon and yeah. they'll put out um bait piles usually of like corn or something like if ducks so put out corn have ducks come in for a couple of days so they get used to being in that location because it's sort of hard to launch the net and not scare them away. We're just dealing with small songbirds primarily. So we do what's called passive mist netting. We just put the nets up and we catch whatever flies through. They are very hard for birds to see if they're not paying attention because I, yeah, I mentioned the picture of volleyball net but they're literally like a thread, picture just like a thread that's been woven um, into squares. So even people, they, they're sort of hard to see because they blend in, they're black. So if you sort of look through it and focus in the distance, you sort of don't even notice them there. So we're just trying to passively sort of catch whatever birds happen to be moving through so that we have um, sort of a more unbiased um, census sort of of what birds are there. It's not totally unbiased because birds that are too big are going to bounce out of these nets. So we don't have an accurate sense of say you know like eagles like i'm not catching eagles in these little fine nets or birds that happen happen to travel high in the treetops the nets are only about six and a half feet tall so there are some biases we're not catching like all the birds that are there on a given day but we're getting a really good cross section of small songbirds i guess that leads me to why do you do this why go through the effort yeah, what's the benefit here yeah so actually the, the bird banding program is run um, through a federal bird banding laboratory, which is actually based in Maryland. It's at the, um, what used to be called the Patuxent Wildlife Research Refuge, they've renamed it. Um, and so the government has been tracking birds this way for over a hundred years. So there's all kinds of data that people can get from doing this kind of research. And it depends who's doing it and why, sort of the results can vary a little bit. So with songbirds, we're really looking at um, how old birds live. If you catch them again and you know when they were banded, um, you can figure out how old they can live to be. And some of these little birds can actually live to be quite old. We have northern cardinals that are 11 years old. Kind of That's amazing. incredible. Um, you can learn sort of where these birds travel. If we band a bird in Maryland, you know, sometimes they get found in Florida. And it's not... Um, 
super detailed. Like we don't know what it did between Maryland and Florida, but you have two points, you know, on a map of, you know, the bird got there somehow. You can um, see which birds are moving through in what numbers over the course of the season. So the sort of the timing of the movement and whether that varies by age and sex. So in a lot of birds in the spring, the males will come through first and older males tend to come through the very first. And it's because they wanna to get to the breeding grounds first to stake out the best territory so that they can attract the best mates. In the fall, the ages and the sexes sort of um, are more muddled together, but that's something that researchers figured out through bird banding. You can do some of this just with observational. There are other methods. You can go out and do what's called point counts where researchers go to a set location and wait a standard amount of time and document every bird they see and hear. Um, but you wouldn't know if you're getting how many birds, you know, like if you're there half an hour, is the robin you hear singing now the robin that was there half an hour earlier, or is it a different robin? So the advantages of banding is, you know, you know, it's a different bird. And then if you catch it again, you know, you know when it was banded and under what circumstances and how old people thought it was at the time. So we also collect some measurements on birds when we have them in the hand. So whether they have visible fat on their body. Birds that are in the process of migrating can store extra fat that you can just blow gently on their bodies and part the feathers. And you can see the fat, it looks like chicken fat, it's kind of yellowish. Um, and a bird that's where it's planning to be for a while doesn't have any fat. So if it's late October and I catch a bird and it's really fat, I know it's still gonna move further south. Obviously you learn yeah. a lot from where they go, where they're coming from. Yeah. It's got to be one of the biggest benefits. Yeah, and it's and there are high tech ways of doing that now with little tiny satellite tags or radio tags. Those cost more money, um, and so you sort of researchers tend to use those in a targeted fashion. There's not enough money to put out radio tags on ten thousand birds in a fall. They cost several hundred dollars per unit. But if you were doing a more specified study on a species for some reason, you know maybe you would put out. 20 or 30 tags. And then you have a track of where that bird moved between point A and B and how long it took to get there. So depending on what you're doing, you can get um, different types of data. So when we catch a bird, we measure its wing length, which is sort of one way of measuring size. We weigh the bird, which is a different way of measuring size. We record the age, the sex of the bird, whether it has any fat on it, um, and then if we're not collecting extra data for some other reason, then we let it go. So oftentimes these birds are only in my hand for 45 seconds. You can do all that really fast when you're in the groove and then you release it and the bird goes back to its, its regular programming. <laughs> That's part one of our conversation with Marin. Be sure to check out next week's episode as we continue our conversation on Baltimore Backyards. If you've enjoyed that episode of Baltimore Backyards, you can check out more episodes by clicking this box down here. And while you're at it, go ahead and tap that circle to subscribe to WMAR2 News for great content posted every day.